Matemba. Comrades, let uh, me acknowledge all of you who were able to tune in and join us this afternoon to go together with a brief 10-15 minutes journey of the World Federation of Trade Unions. Let me from the onset uh, greet all of you and the workers in the world, the workers in our continent, the workers in South Africa, the affiliate of WFTU, the National Centre in South Africa, the Congress of South African Trade Unions and her affiliates, greeting you in the name of the National Education, Health and Allied Workers in your National Office bearers as led by President Mzandile Mokwaeba, at whose behest I'm very privileged to represent the collective in presenting this brief lecture. The 2020 marks the 75th anniversary of the oldest the international working class organizations or trade union movement known as WFTU, World Federation of Trade Unions. It is a very momentous uh, milestone of which we are very lucky to be existing at a time when such a gigantic militant organization celebrates uh, this milestone. We have been directed by the headquarters and the presidential council that we must uh, conduct all of us as affiliates across the world activities that are going to lead into the culmination of the actual birth date, which is the 3rd of October 1945. We must have these seminars, we must have rallies, we must have protests, we must have marches and all sorts of forms that we're going to use to conscientize and unite workers around this class-oriented organization. Because of the unconventional method that we are using this time around, we're going to quickly run through the brief history of uh, the formation of WAFTU, the the role of WAFTU in South Africa or in Africa, the role of WAFTU in fighting for the workers' rights across the globe. And we're going to conclude briefly by talking about the context within which the 75th anniversary of WFTU takes place globally, but particularly in the country, which is going to scan the work that is cut out for all of us as members of these unions going forward. Coincidentally, comrades, this anniversary is taking place when the world is undergoing what I will call a World War III. The world is a, going through a war against an invisible enemy of the humankind, that if not properly defeated, it will diminish the existence of the human beings. I'm saying coincidentally because WAFTO was formed, as I said, on the 3rd of October 1945, at the conclusion of the Second World War. And it is a world war that when it ended, for the Soviet Union at the time was a victory of the Red Army against the Nazi fascist regime at the time. But its aim, comrades, it was to unite and bring together all the international workers' organizations in, across the world together into one along the side or along the lines of the United Nations. It sought to replace an organization that was existing at the time called the IFTU, the International Federation of Trade Unions. And as I said, the mission was to bring together trade unions organizations across the world into one. The organizers of this uh, Congress that they gave birth to WAFTU in Paris, 1945, were largely unions uh, from 
the United States, the unions in the United Kingdom, the unions in France, the unions in Italy, and of course other continents of the world. I must say that at the conclusion of the World War II, the world was divided into two blocks, which in other area is commonly known as the bipolar world. In other words, there existed two global power houses or power blocks. The one led by the Soviet Union, the other one led by the United States and mostly galvanizing the Western European countries. This divide was affecting all spheres of society across the globe, be it in terms of trade, be it in terms of politics, be it in terms of the social economics, be it in terms of military, and how the governments will align. So the, the countries across the world, in particular in the Europe, were either aligned to the Soviet Union, Russia, or aligned to the West as led by the United States of America. It was during the contestation of this period which it was also called the Cold War. There was a Cold War. The countries around these two blocks were living in fear about being swallowed by another or being demolished by one power block or another. WAFTO was actually aligned to the Soviet Union. It was socialist orientated. As we call ourselves, we are a class oriented organization. It was what it was called then the communist faction within WAFTO. Because the Cold War was raging on, those contestations was also taking place even inside the trade union movement globally. There were a serious attempts to try and unite the differences between what was then called the communist aligned and the non-communist factions within WAFTO. Those were t attempts, comrades, I must say, they eventually failed. The communists stood their ground and won the day in as far as the debate inside the WAFTO is concerned. And because the Cold War was now intensifying, remember the Cold War was not just about the military power forces or the economic power forces, but what also the ideological direction, the social re-engineering of the world post the World War II. How is the world outlook supposed to look like? Is it supposed to perpetuate or promote the private accumulation or is it supposed to perpetuate a redistributive kind of an economy wherein there is a sharing of the world, there is a, a bridging the gap or the divide between the haves and the have-nots, question of making sure that the issues of the healthcare system are distributed equally and equitably so to the humankind across the globe, or it must be the preserve of those who have. Those were the debates that were raging on within the working class or the workers' organization at the time. Trade union movements from various countries were beginning to align themselves very heavily and be influenced and even be funded by the ideological stand of their different governments or the countries that they come from. To that extent, this Cold War, when as it was intensifying, it ended up succeeding in splitting the World Federation of Trade Unions. When you read history of WAFTU, it is said that non-communist trade unions lived WAFTU. So if you like it, there was a split. If you liked, there was no split. Those who felt that they are, they are not non-communist, they've left the World Federation of Trade Unions. And they formed what was called uh, the International Confederation of Free Trade Unions, ICFTU, because there was a view that those who aligned to the so-called communist countries like Soviet Union are actually not a free trade unions. I'm sure today, in our current 
existence of the trade unions in our country. There is this debate about the so-called independent and not independent trade union movement. But more importantly then, you will, you will remember that the United States of America's aligned trade unions advocated for what to, we call the free market economic model, so to speak, which we call capitalism today. In other words, I must be free and be allowed to accumulate as much wealth as I can, even if it's at the expense of the poor, the marginalized, and the workers in general. Whilst on the other hand, the WAFTU or the Soviet Union Aligned Trade Unions, which were the majority in WAFTU, advocated for a more equitable share of the wealth, the elimination of the exploitation of the workers by the bosses, and making sure that the, the workers have got the right to bargain for what they think they are worth. But more importantly, WAFTA have always advocated for a seven-hour working day and a 40-hour working week something which the capitalist-orientated trade unions at the time would not have accepted. And that's what it's led, had led to the split or to the leaving of the non-communist members of WAFT at the time. I'm sure by the time we reach the 3rd of October, more education about what we stand for, where we come from, the battles, ideological also that was taking place at the time, aided by the various government, the CIA of America at the time, will have been brought to the light of the workers. But importantly to note, Kumrit, is that the largest affiliates of WAFTO are actually found in the developing nations, such as Asia, Latin America, and Africa. Of course, France, Portugal, and Italy do come in very strongly there with the number of uh, membership there. And it is no surprising because those are the countries and the nation which WAFTA has always been on their side during their developing struggles in their country, the difficult times for the struggles for self-determination, the difficult time for struggles against colonialism. Because part of what was ranging during the Cold War was the struggle to expand each power block across the globe. Colonialism was uh, on the rampage Imperialism was a finding more expression, particularly in Africa, in Latin America, and so on and so on. So that is the reasons why the Soviet Union in particular was on the side of those who were still struggling or fighting for a self-determination, fighting for the independence, fighting to make sure that they rid themselves of colonialism, just like ourselves in this country. And the trade union movement internationally, such as WAFTO, was on the side of those countries. That is why it is not surprising or no magic that uh, it is those countries that have got the biggest membership in the, in the federation called WAFT today. What continues to divide these two organizations today, is, other than the interest of the workers, which are the same irrespective of the color of the t-shirt you wear or the organization you belong to, is this ideological standing. Are you class oriented? or are you of the left oriented, or are you of the right wing oriented, or the imperialist oriented trade union organization. WAFTO has fought side by side, or if you like, shoulder to shoulder, with the, the predecessor to our Congress of South African Trade Union today, the South African Congress of Trade Union, SACTU. It has been present in all its congresses since 1955, and it has always made demands and in their message of support of the release of all the, the, the trade union leaders that were apprehended and imprisoned, of the house burning that uh, was there, uh, of the political prisoners that was there. They've always advocated for the South African working people to be allowed to form uh, trade unions because at the time, in the 50s, we were not allowed to form trade unions in these countries. When WAFTA was formed, as I said, along the lines of the United Nations, 
It was at the time of the formations of a number of multilateral organizations such as, such as the international labor organizations and so on and so on. It, it is in that platform that WAFTO was representing the interest of the workers in, and lobbying governments, including at some point where it succeeded to influence WAFTO to make sure that all the trade unions must adopt an attitude against the government of South Africa at the time in order to make sure that workers are allowed to form the organizations of their trade, workers are allowed to work a, a reasonable working hour per day and per week, workers are allowed to receive uh, pension funds, workers are allowed to receive the equal pay of the work of equal value. These are the struggles that the WAFTA has advocated, including banishing into houses of the trade union leaders and the, uh, the imprisonment of le union leaders was supposed to be done away with. So WAFTA has been there. In 1956, a resolution was taken by SACTO in their Congress. Remember that uh, before that Congress, SACTO was more like COSATO in the recent years, was flirting with the two organizations, ICF2 at the time and the WAFTO at the time, because they've been trying to make sure that the unit of workers across the globe must be of a paramount importance and must uh, be put at the agenda of every Congress. But in 1956, SACTU firmly took a resolution to affiliate to WAFTU. And this Nihau has always maintained that we didn't join WAFTU. We were born in WAFTU because as soon as we became members of the Federation COSATU, which is a successor of SACTU, it meant that uh, we are inherently members of WAFTU. From 1960 to 1965, Moses Ngane Mabida, who was the deputy president of SACTO, and World Kwai were serving in the presidential council of WAFTU. So this thing of uh, affiliates or unions in South Africa belonging to the leadership structure of WAFTU is not starting now. It's not actually a fashion. It is actually part of the history of our struggle in this country and the evolution of the trade union movement in the country and in the whole globe. These two comrades were actually succeeded to serve in the structures of WAFTO by one Mark Shope, former Mkonto Wesizwe, who also, together with Ray Alexander Simons, were sent by SAG2 into these congresses, into these structures of WAFTO to serve in the but when the political punishment in the country became intense, actually, Comrade Mark Schaub worked from the 1970s in the headquarters of WAF today, operating on the one hand to work in terms of trade union movement in Africa and Latin America, but also as an underground operative of the African National Congress in exile. The headquarters of WAF too, just like many progressive headquarters of many liberation movements across the globe, served also as some of the underground operation centers of the African National Congress and the South African Communist Party. At that time, the ICFTU, when they realized that they are losing SAC2 into WAFTU, they also convinced themselves to adopt a resolutions that was to denounce the apartheid regime of this country. They were joined by other United States unions, Britons and Italy, that were not progressive, that were on the, on the right. A number of uh, trade union leaders and the liberation movement struggle heroes served in the structures of WAFT. Comrade like John Kandeming, Comrade like Stalin, Michali, and many others. These comrades is an indication that the Congress movement, I'm talking about the alliance that we have between the African National Congress, the Congress of South African Trade Union, and the South African Communist Party, was not born because it was now nice in 1994. All of our predecessors, be the ANC, be COSATO, be the party, were together in the trenches to fight for the liberation of uh, this country. It is inherent in our DNA that we find ourselves as part of the Congress movement today 
Because if you look at uh, Comrade Moses Mapida, you're not going to find him only as a leader of the Communist Party or as a leader of the, South Af of, of the Congress of South African Trade Union or as a leader of the ANC. You'll find him in all of those. You'll not find Comrade Stalin, Eric Michali, as a member of the Communist Party or as the ANC stalwart, but you'll also find him in headquarters of WAFTU. You will not find Zane Alexander only in the trade union movement or only in the ANC. You will find him in the headquarters of WAFTU. You will find him in SATU. You will find him in the ANC. If you talk of Mark Shop today, you, uh, 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 whom last year the ANC was celebrating his centenary, you will find him as a leader of the trade union movement, SATU, and also WAFTU. It is on their shoulders that we continue to persecute this struggle to liberate and emancipate the working class, to transform the living conditions of our people as a collective Congress movement, not as a sectarian or individual uh, alliance partners, because a revolution such as ours, the National Democratic Revolution, it is impossible for it to be achieved by a single organization. History is littered with experience and lessons in various countries in the globe where one organization sought to try and fight and persecute a liberation struggle and a revolution on its own without building a tactical alliance that are sustainable, that have got a common purpose in terms of ideological and strategic clarity uh, in terms of the uh, logical conclusion of that struggle. So that's where we are, and that's who we are, and that's what WAFTO is to us, comrades. In conclusion, comrades, the context within which the 75th anniversary is being celebrated in this country, in the world, is that we are fighting a global pandemic called novel COVID-19, which has brought sharply to the fore the correctness of that which WAFTO has always advocated for. WAFTO has advocated and to some extent won victories in this aspect that nations and government must prioritize as a matter of necessity the state role in the economy, the state role in the intervention of the well-being of its society. In other words, nation must prioritize the public expenditure. This is one ideological stance that led to the breakaway uh, of these other unions from WAFTO to form their own organization. Because the ones that were aligned to the United States were now advocating for a lesser expenditure on the public service the lesser role of the state on the economy. Public service is not an employment agency. He, he, the public service is too bloated. He, he, the public wage bill is too high. The economy cannot sustain. These are not new discussions. Our old debates that were started at the time of the existence of the Cold War and also the bipolar world at the time are actually the reason why we had uh, the, what was called the pro-Soviet Union bloc and the pro-United States bloc at the time. But what has COVID-19 shown is that at no point where you are going to succeed to have a society and a nation that is healthy, an economy that is healthy, without the role that is greater of the public service in it. Had we invested in this country, on the national health insurance long time ago, had we as a state put resources to put the national health insurance into place, where in the public health system was supposed to be in a such a capacity today to respond to any burden of disease in this country, we wouldn't be having this panic that we are having today now that we are having a COVID-19 uh, in our shores. 
it is clear today you can make as much money as possible but when the disease such as what we are having today visits you you'll need a public health system supported and anchored by the state participation in it in order to defeat that kind of a disease today it is the state that is supposed to bail out almost every business that is going to lose money because of the lockdown and because of the covid-19 it is the taxpayers money in the hands of the state that are going to be used to bail out companies that are going to be used to bail out businesses that are going to be used to bail out individual private owners of means of productions it is the state it is your money and my money at the hands of the state that is going to bail out those people this shows that we should have long time ago intervened in the economy as a state and have a bigger state through our state owned institutions but also through our budget uh, pronouncements we should have used our legislative framework to compel the reserve bank long time ago to intervene in the debt that we have in the form of the debts that the SOE SO is are having from the private lenders to date for the third time in a row the reserve bank is forced to cut down the repo rates in order to stimulate the economy something that they could they should have done as a matter of necessity long time ago they are only doing it now because the private sector is screaming poverty today what the working class and the poor is at witnessing today in the world is that we are now nationalizing the economic hardship of the private sector we are now nationalizing we must now all of us own when the economy is not doing well we must now all of us own collectively through our taxpayers we must now own the private problems that private people are having by not making income because they are not making profit uh, during this covid-19 but when they are making profit those profits are private we don't get to share on their profit these comrades is the work that is cut out for us as a working class and the trade union movement going forward once the covid-19 comes and go our state is bailing out these private companies these big businesses without making them to make guarantee that they are not going to retrench workers workers are still going to be retrenched this is a struggle that led by the world federation of trade unions we must continue to to fight and to feed it is clear that we could have built many hospitals and clinics in this country had we had a political will as you can see now we are building what is called field hospital facilities today it is clear that we could have been able to provide proper water and sustain and, and, and sanitation that is sustainable to our people without being pushed by anything as when you look at the, how many jojo tanks that we have procured now through the department of water and sanitation today it is clear that we can't be able to have a hygiene society if we don't have the running water in all our rural areas for you to have clean sustainable running water you need a public service that is capacitated that is properly staffed that is properly motivated and remunerated it is clear that for the economy to return to its normality to go back to its business and making money without a fear of getting a covid-19 you need a public service in other words you need nurses you need doctors you need teachers you need police to enforce the law you need soldiers out there this is the public service that has been neglected for a very very long time from where we stand the debate about whether the public expenditure by the state is necessary or not is been settled now we should not have cut the budget on public health we should not have cut the budget on education we should not have cut the budget on the infrastructure in this country if we were class oriented and led by the ideas of the world federation of trade unions it has brought to bear how much 
inequality still exists in our society. Even how the state responds today, it still responds in a manner that perpetuates the inequalities that we have in this country. When the lockdown was first announced, just the partial lockdown, when the gathering was restricted to 100 people, it was those who have money, it was those who are rich, who flocked to the shops and bought all of the essentials from the shops. At a time when we were calling, there was, a, there was panic buying. The rest of us who were waiting for math end, the rest of us who were waiting for the disability grants and the pension grant, we couldn't flock to the shops because we did not have money. They went to the shops, they stocked everything else, including sanitizer, the masks, the foods, the tissues, and they went away. The rest of us, by the time we get paid at the end of the month, we went to the shop, there was nothing there. Because they are ready, because they have stocked up the medications, they've stocked up the winter clothes, they've stocked out the food, they've stocked out the everything, they are ready to isolate themselves should they be visited by the, this COVID-19 they are now calling for the economy to open, to return to normal because they are losing money. It is because they are clear. It is not them who they are going to be in those shops, in those workplaces. It is not them who are going to be contracting this virus. It is not them who are going to die in numbers. It is the poor, the working class and the vulnerable. The rest of us, they are sending us out there to continue to produce the money for them in order for them to continue to make profit. They are not concerned about saving lives. Of course, comrades, we would like to return to the level of where economic activities are taking place as fast as possible because we are clear that we cannot sustain the economy using the UIF and the, and the grants or the food parcels that perpetuate the corruption, by the way. We need to save lives of workers but also save their jobs. But we need to do so when we are clear that it is safe to do so. You can see the interest of the capitalists on the one hand and the working class on the other hand. They want us to open the economy not because they care much about the survival of the humanity, but because now they are clear that they are ready to continue to make money. Now, we are saying, comrades, it is a struggle that when we go back we must unite, we must do whatever we can to make sure that we defeat not only this pandemic, but all those things that come uh, together with the COVID-19. The loss of job, the loss of income, uh, the continuous uh, accumulation of uh, the capitalist uh, classes, and the threat of the retrenchments on the workers. I hope, comrades, I've done a bit to uh, highlight the history of uh, the World Federation of Trade Unions. It's not exhaustive given the platform we are using. It's not exhaustive given the time we have. It's not ex exhaustive given the unconventional method that we are using to conduct this lecture which uh, is, uh, is limited. But uh, we hope, comrades, uh, we shall continue to learn from one another as more and more affiliates and more and more leaders come to this platform and try and educate us. But uh, as I was saying, our country can learn from this gigantic fed federation of the workers. Our country can change the manner in which we do things going forward in order for us to, to better the lives of our people. Amanda.